Oh, hello. In this video, we're going to explore why I think I'm far too stupid for the new bloodied kill team. So, it's going to be a kill team rundown video, uh, the same as the Phobos one. Um, let's get started by looking at the basic team roster. So, it's a little bit of a complicated roster. They've done some really clever things uh, with how they're kind of adapting their format. So, first thing to say is they only have Seek and Destroy which I regard, I think it's commonly regarded as being the worst deck. Um, I am convinced more and more that they are not using archetypes as a balance mechanism. So whatever kind of internal spreadsheet they have when they're trying to balance things, I don't think they've assigned a value for archetypes. I think archetypes are just being made as a, a background uh, a background decision like what what fits this team because I understand why they've got so you can destroy from a narrative point of view but it's clearly not it's clearly not being taken as a balanced thing because I think this is a fairly weak team on the weekend of a bespoke team certainly and yet they've gone for the worst archetype and no choice of archetypes which kind of feels a bit like insult to injury let me know what you think in the comments 12 to 14 models so a very variable number of models you can take we've seen this before with things like the town the drones and the um the krieg and the offboard artillery so let's look exactly how that's going to work you have two well three buckets you have your leader bucket uh, where you have to take a leader then you've got your main bucket where you take nine models from a list of uh, 11 models. So basically you are never going to take the... I'll get my pen. So you're always taking a leader um, and then you've got to take nine out of this list. There's 11 in this list, but you're never going to take the traitor trooper from this list. So you're picking nine out of these 10. Um, bear in mind that that you can only have two of the when I say there's 10 um, there's actually 12 but you can only take two gunners that's down here so you can only have two gunners and the gunners are unique so effectively you're looking at taking two gunners one of everything and then you have to choose one thing one specialist or gunner from this section to leave behind then you've got this second bucket where you can take four from the list, which is a bad way of explaining it. Basically, you can take the Enforcer and the Ogryn, or you can take four troopers, and they're like the Krieg troopers, they have GA2. Or you can take an Enforcer and two troopers, or an Ogryn and two troopers. Okay, so the basically the think of the think it as being two selections, and the troopers take up half half a selection, right? Um, the leader has, for the first time, really genuine choices. We see these ch weapons choices, and it's usually just a case of picking the best one. The leader can either pick to have a lackluster pistol, so this first option, um, auto pistol or las pistol, semicolon, chainsaw or power weapon. So ignore the chainsaw there, that's a trap. Um, auto pistol and las pistol are the same thing in kill team, so you're taking a, a las pistol effectively, and a power weapon or you can take a bolt gun and a chainsaw a bolt pistol sorry and a chainsaw or you can take a bolt gun or a plasma pistol and an improvised blade which is like a sub chainsaw weapon so you've got one option to take a power weapon one option to take a plasma pistol one option to take a bolt pistol and a chainsaw and one option to take a bolt gun i don't think the middle two are worth bothering with certainly the bolt gun is pointless i think the bolt pistol is pretty pointless but i think there's a genuine choice between do I want a LAS pistol and a power weapon, or do I want a plasma pistol and an improvised blade? Um, yeah, so that's basically the way that it works. Uh, and let's go through the data sheets individually. Now, I've changed the order up from the book to make them a little bit more uh, logical. Let's look at them now. Oh no, hang on, I forgot. We've got our ability, of course, to look at. So they have one ability. It is the bloodied kill team with the bloodied ability. Basically, they have a very kind of corn theme. The more that they kill people, they're trying to spill blood, and the more they spill blood, they get bloody tokens. So they have an extra resource to track in the same way as novitiates and their faith points. Um, but it feels like it's all the paperwork of novitiates for none of the actual oomph. Um, 
the bloody ability is nowhere near as powerful as the face point ability but it does require um that extra tracker so let's look at exactly how it works you have a pool of bloody tokens um you get one each initiative phase so you're going to get one each turn and then if you incapacitate an enemy in the turn you get one and if you lose a friendly in the turn you get another one so you're getting one to three each turn and there are some other ways unique to the operatives and boosting that that we'll look at in your strategy phase you can effectively dole out your bloodied points from your pool and give them to models um there's no benefit to giving them to basically you know, there's no point giving them to what more than one to a model you you're wanting your models to gain the status of being bloody right once four or more of your operatives are bloody you can additionally select one to be under the gaze of the gods until the end of the turning point so being bloody by itself um, means that when you fight or shoot when you're rolling an attack dice um, you can before you roll you can retain a successful normal hit without rolling it if you are um, designated as being under the gaze of the gods so you've already got four bloodied guys and you are um able to nominate one of them as being under the gaze of the gods he can retain a successful critical instead of uh, retaining a successful normal hit it's good it just doesn't it's not it, what it doesn't do is make them any more survivable okay so it's good it's a little bit of bookkeeping there um but it, yeah let's move on so our leader, we got to take him. Um, he has a couple of things. So he has the bloodied icon. So we're starting off down here. The bloodied icon. Um, and basically, if he's up in the thick of it, and with his weapon choices, he probably will be, uh, when he's up in the thick of it, um, when someone else with a bloody token is incapacitated, if they're within red of the leader, you can kind of suck that blood back up uh, into your pool, take it off the board, put it back on your dice or however you're marking how many bloody tokens you have available to you. And then at the start of the next turn, you can dole that back out. So it lets you kind of keep your bloody in play, your, your bloody tokens rather. And then lead with strength. Each time this operative fights in combat on a shooting attack, if he has a bloody token and he's more than red from your drop zone, treat him as if he's under the gaze of the gods. So effectively lets you have an extra gaze of the gods guy, uh, your leader. And I reckon a lot of the time you're going to give your leader that first bloody token that you start the game with. As I said on the previous page, the leader does have to basically make a choice. You can take um, different options. It basically boils down to picking between the plans of pistol and the power weapon uh, i think cleverer people than me will come up with the situation when you prefer the power weapon i feel like there probably is a situation when you prefer the power weapon but i think in general because shooting is just more effective than combat especially when you've got eight wounds and you're not going to survive that many rounds of combat i think that the standard pick is going to be the plasma pistol um but if you think there's times when you'd want the power weapon, or heck, if you think there's times when you'd want the, the bolt pistol and chainsaw, the kind of middle of the road option, or even the bolt gun, which I've totally dismissed out of hand, you do let me know in the comments. Uh, while you're down there, a subscription to the channel would really help. We're closing in on uh, 500. When we get to 500 subs, I'm going to have to think of something special to do. Maybe like a, do a question and answer video or something like that. I don't know. Right, the traitor commsman, he has the traitor comms thing, which is great. We love to see a comms officer. He also lets us do this sacrilegious actuation action. So for one AP, he can select a friendly bloodied operative visible to him within red. You can remove his bloodied token and pull it back into the pool. So uh, you can't be a token the officer is only treated as having. Um, and then you can assign it to a... So basically it lets you move your bloodied tokens around outside of the appointed time um yeah and also he doesn't have to if you have a bloody token in your pool so for example if someone's died within red of your leader and you've put one back in your pool it says you can select a friendly operative blah 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 so you don't have to take one off to put one on you can just use his ability to assign a bloody token from the pool at a different point in the middle of the turn if you've just gained a bloody token 
um, which is quite nice. I guess we'll talk about, we didn't talk about it with the leader, we'll talk about their stat block. It's the standard kind of guardsman, uh, novitiate, etc. Uh, stat block. So they got a five up save, they got seven wounds. Uh, it's just guardsman, it's you know, three death, three move, two APL, GA1. So it is exactly like Krieg. They've got a last gun and a bayonet, like a Krieg. Uh, they're not actually that like the Krieg. It's quite funny, but superficially, they certainly are. The traitor corpsman. Uh, not not Coleman. Corpse, corpsman with an, with, with an E. Um, so we've talked about him a lot already because uh, GW did a preview on him. He has a couple of things going on. Um, he is a medic. He has the medic keyword. Look, there it is. Um, and he, as part of that, he does actually have the ability to... Um, there, you, there it is. Up here. Uh, regain 2d3 loss wounds. So a couple of people have said, oh, he's not a medic. You're all making a terrible mistake. He does retain the ability to do the medic stuff. Okay. So it's there, 2d3 lost wounds, that's good. But, um, more interestingly, with that same action, um, he can he can buff people. He can give you the permanent to the end of the game buff to be relentless, or the permanent to the end of the game buff. And Not all, and, you can do it both. Two different turns, but you can do it both. The permanent to the end of the game buff to get six up, feel no pain. And he has this ability that when you select him for deployment, um, you can start something with one of those buffs. So I guess typically what you're going to do is set him up near your Ogryn. You can start the game with your Ogryn with one of the buffs, then you can set the Corman and give him the other buff, and then you've beefed up your Ogryn for the whole game, and then the Corman can go off and do some medic stuff or buff other models in your in your in your team. It's pretty good. It's pretty solid. Uh, and he, as I say, what he doesn't have is the ability to revive. So he does have the healing part, the medic ability. He is a medic with the medic keyword, but he doesn't have the ability to revive people, which is arguably the more important part. The important part, half of being a medic, but he's half a medic plus an interesting buffing character. Traitor Brimstone Grenadier uh, gets free frag and crack grenades. So that means that you can have four cracks, and this is a team where you're going to want to take... If you, if you want to make these work, I think you're taking four crack grenades. I think crack grenades are basically the key. Uh, he also has this diabolic, with a K, bomb, um, which is basically like a super frag grenade. The key thing being it has splash two, so it's going to hit a lot of people. Um, three, three, that's pretty good. He also explodes when he dies, so if the objective is incapacitated, you can use this ability. If you do so, roll 1d6, subtracting 1 from the result. If this operative is engaged in range of enemy operative uh, on a 3-up, each operative visible to him within white gets d3 mortal wounds. That's quite good. It's not gonna it's not gonna change much, but it could be that it comes in, you know, either does some chip damage or finishes somebody off. Re basically you're taking him for the free crack grenade and then the, the diabolic bomb after the thrown his crack grenade doesn't hurt you either. Traitor Sharpshooter is a pretty standard guy with a silent sniper rifle that's three three with one mortal wound. Uh, it's not heavy, so he can move around freely, which is good. And he has double retained from cover thanks to his camo cloak. Uh, a pretty standard piece, but, but pretty cool. And then you've got your traitor gunner. Um, you know, his special training is that he has a plasma gun, um, which is nice and simple, not much to say. I guess you're probably taking a plasma and a grenade launcher. Um, I, I feel like what, what guns you're taking is kind of a solved a solved equation as far as kill team goes at the minute. I guess you're rostering a melter gun for the those super elite teams and, and things like that, and talons and other folks where you just really want to have a melter gun instead of the grenade launcher. Um, but the grenade launcher's ability to lob a crack down down the map at long range, I think, edges it over in most cases. You're never taking a flamer. Flamers are better than people think, but they're just not worth the opportunity cost when it's on a, a guy with the access to a plasma gun or a melter gun or a grenade launcher. Okay, so now we're into the combat specialist. So I kind of separated out. We had the leader, and then we had all the sort of generic um, buffing characters, and then we had the shooting characters, and now we're on to the... There's a lot of combat guys. So the butcher is, I think, the best of the combat specialists. Not least because he has 4-6 with lethal 5-up, which would be a good... A, a good 
uh, stat line just by itself, but also he's got his unholy sustenance. So whenever he fights in combat, if you incapacitate, you regain D3 lost wounds. That's really good. And blood offering, he gets you extra bloody tokens. Uh, when he fights in combat with the resolve successful hits step of the combat, the first time you strike a crit, bear in mind you have a lethal five up as well. The first time that you strike with a crit, you get an extra bloody token, which is nice to have. I like the the butcher. I think he's going to be in nearly every list. Flenzer, another range, another combat fellow. He doesn't have range weapon at all. Uh, neither did the, the the butcher come to think of it. These are good candidates for grenades, folks. You're going to want to take cracks uh, in this team. I am almost certain of it. Um, your skinning knives, three four. Uh, he has ability called stalk. Uh, so it is ceaseless as well, which makes him a bit more reliable. Ceaseless. Um, so if he's within white of heavy or light terrain, you've got that lethal five up, which is going to get you over to that four plus. And you can charge from incapacitated. So he's a little bit ha less hard hitting and a little less vital than the butcher. But I think he's still a good model. You can sneak up on people and get into combat with them. And there's not that much you can do uh, about that, which is pretty, pretty good. Fug is your next combat, next combat guy. Um, and he's just really consistent. He has a 4 4 weapon, so he's going to do four damage he's if he gets crits it just makes them harder for the opponent to block with brutal um and tough which lets him try and um i've just noticed i've, I've typed very consist ant not consistent consist ant that's, that's good uh every time he fights in combat or shooting attacks made against him subtract one from the normal damage of an enemy operative weapons for that combat or shooting attack to a minimum of one yeah that makes him a bit hardier. He's still only got seven wounds. He does his save's gone up to a four plus. Um, so he's got like his little metal waistcoat on there, which is going to make him a bit harder. He's basically a bit of a tar pit. Uh, he gets into combat with people, and he's going to give people a decent run for their money in combat. You know, he hits them for four. He takes the hit in return. He hits them again for four, and then hopefully they're dead, depending on the team that you're fighting against. Um, you know, against elites you'll struggle, but you've got to outnumber them, so you've got to trade for half damage, you know. Yeah, I like the thug. We go on to the trench sweeper. The trench sweeper is funny. I don't know if anyone played Counter-Strike. I remember when they put the shield in. This is a first-person shooter game, uh, for those of you that don't. I remember when they put the shield into Counter-Strike at the first place. Everyone thought that the shield was this really cheap and cheesy thing. And in Counter-Strike, the shield works in exactly the way they're trying to emulate with the rule here, with this shielding rule. So if you ever played Counter-Strike, you can press the right click and you put your shield in front of you. So you're looking through the little vision slit and then you can move much slower, but you're basically invulnerable to people shooting at you because all the bullets are bouncing off your shield. And that's exactly what he can do, okay? So he pulls the shield in front of him and each time he's activated, use the ability. Um, if you do so, until he's next activated, each shooting attack made against him in the roll defense dice step, you can re-roll any or all of your defense dice, but you subtract a circle from your movements, you're only moving two. It's really flavorful and interesting and cool. Uh, you can also use your shield in combat. In combat, what it lets you do is parry away two successful hits rather than one. So he's pretty good at, at sticking around in combat. Um, he's got a shotgun. Three, three, four dice hitting on two. Yeah, it's not awful, but it does have that range limitation. I feel like he's the one most likely to be left on the side. However, I could be wrong about that. There is, when we get to the stratagems, a bit of a tech that makes uh, maybe the trench sweeper not be so bad. We'll have to see. We'll have to see. The Enforcer. So now we're into the special bucket. We're, so we're looking at the Enforcer, the Ogryn, and then we'll conclude by looking at the Trooper. Um, so the Enforcer's got a similar stat line to all the others. He's got a four up save and an extra wound. Uh, the Enforcer's basic thing is he has a Power Fist. So we know what a Power Fist is. It's 5, 7 and Brutal and we like a Power Fist. Um, he has Grueling Disciplinarian. While a friendly bloodied operative is visible to him within blue, it's not treated as being injured. Uh, it's just such a short bubble that it feels quite situational. You know, you have to you know, have to buddy up with somebody and hope that they become injured at some point to benefit from that. He also has this unique action, Enforce. 
for one AP, select one other friendly blooded operative that is not ready and is visible. So not ready, so someone that's already active and is visible within blue of this operative, then select one of the following. You can either do a free dash or if they have an engage order, they can perform an overwatch action. I guess one of the best things to do if you're taking the traitor enforcer might be to stand him next to your plasma gunner. You know, um, you activate this. First of all, it means if your plasma gunner gets shot uh, and, and wounded, which is going to happen quickly with seven wounds, you can use the traitor enforcer to uh, let him ignore his penalty for being wounded. It means that after you've shot your plasma gunner um, and you've got a kill, he re remains a threat because at any point, if you've got your enforcer nearby, you can decide to go, oh, um, you know, um, I'm going to activate and I'm immediately going to do Overwatch with my plasma gun. And this is a team that's not typically going to get Overwatch because it's going to be probably the one of those numerous teams on the table. So you've got that thing there where you can hide uh, him near the, the, the plasma gunner. And then you could you can use that to immediately jump in and do an overwatch shot with the plasma gunner, which your opponent probably isn't going to let you do because they're not going to feed you a second person after you've just plasma gunned them. But the fact that they will know that you can do that will let you lock down a chunk of the board because you've got that threat even after you've shot the plasma gun. Because normally, if you shoot a plasma gun, and then you've got all the rest of the activations in the turn, and then your opponent goes, well, at least the plasma gun is gone now, so I don't have to worry about him for this turn. That worry still has to be in your opponent's mind, even though it is Overwatch and it's going to be uh, hitting on minus hitting on minus one BS. But the worry is, I think, why you take it and do it that way. But then if you're doing that, if you're hanging around the back as a support piece, you're not really using this power fist to the best of your ability. I mean, the best you're going to have to say is a lot of teams are going to try and come to your deployment zone. So you're keeping it at the back there like a counter charge piece, um, standing next to your plasma gun or your grenade launcher or your sniper, even whoever it is that's ranged. And then when somebody comes to sort them out uh, and then you go, OK, well, I got my enforcer here and he can potentially one hit them if they're if they're a normal sized, a normal sort of chassis um, or, or two hit them, certainly, you know, so. Bear in mind, of course, the Enforcer comes at the opportunity cost of two troopers. A lot of the people who've already had this set for a couple of weeks are uh, kind of a leaning towards taking the two troopers instead. You know that Krieg players love their troopers and they love giving their troopers crack grenades. GA2 guys with crack grenades and you can crack grenade at while while you crack. Two crack grenades in a single activation is strong. But as much as I love crack grenades, especially in this team, I do think that you have so many guys that don't have a, um, a ranged weapon at all already that you're not actually short of people to hold your grenades. You're not actually short of people, you know, you've got your, your, your various combat specialists that haven't got a gun. You're not short of people to hold your grenades. So I lean towards taking the Enforcer, actually, as much as I'm aware that the Receive Wisdom is... Um, not to take two troopers because I quite like the ability of that in force action to get an out of sequence, an out of sequence overwatch action. But that's just me, I could be dead wrong. Let, again, let me know in the comments, um, you know, while you're down there. So I've already said to subscribe, but you know, just in case you ignore me the first time, you should subscribe. We should get to 500, you know, you want to. The Traitor Ogryn. So the Traitor Ogryn is a beat stick um, and he is absolutely splendid when he is buffed up by the Corpsman and he receives his his, his, his buffs where he can re-roll his misses and he can have his 6 up feel no pain with his 16 wounds. That's obnoxious. I feel like at the start of every game with these, you're going to start the Ogryn with one of those buffs and you're going to very quickly inject him and give him that second buff. And then you're going to wobble up the field like a big distraction carnifex and just go, I'm a 16 wound Ogryn, what are you going to do about me? You know, um, while hopefully the rest of your the rest of your um, team plays the game and does things, the Ogre is just going to wobble about and try and draw your opponent's attention. He's got 16 wounds. He's going to have his six up, feel no pain. Um, he, he doesn't care when he's uh, injured. It doesn't make him lose uh, his APLs. Well, no, he does care about being injured, but he doesn't lose his APLs. He's not affected by stun. He's just a great kind of great kind of guy that can just you know and if he gets in combat he's going to cause a lot of pain he's going to cause a lot of pain with a five six rending stun weapons yeah yeah yeah, yeah. you can't 
can't interact with mission objectives or do mission actions. But to be fair, you've got 11 other guys who are doing that for you. Okay? You don't need him to do those things. Now, the Traitor Trooper, uh, you know, it's like the Krieg. They're GA2 guys with last guns. A lot of people really rate them. A lot of people I see online are saying, oh, well, you, you know, you take the Ogrim, but then I guess you take two troopers instead of the Enforcer. Mm. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. I certainly roster them, you know, especially if you've got Blackstone Fortress. So you've got a pile of generic Lasgun guys that fit right in with this team knocking around. But I think if you're someone that's getting Morok uh, and you're getting it onto your table and you've got your 10 models to build, I wouldn't build a basic trooper. I, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd build my leader and um, my nine specialists um, and use the two extra guys. And then in the fullest time, if you want to pick up those extra models to use as troopers, go for it. But I don't think uh, I don't think you're going to worry about that to start off with. I think it's a bit of a... I could be totally wrong. I could be totally wrong when it turns out everybody has loads of success with this team running at 14 models. But personally, I like the Enforcer. But some people say, yeah, as I've said on the slide, consider it. Use your brain. Consider it for yourself. Understand that there are people out there that advocate it. Um... I don't know why I've got the laser pointer. Here we go. Woo, it's like being at work. Um, yeah, understand that there are people that advocate for this. Okay, but I, mm, I'm not sure. Actually, I've not played them and I'm probably never going to play them um, for reasons that I'm going to discuss. I don't think they're the team for me, but if you play them and you find yourself liking the troopers, then yeah, just be aware that the option's there for you, okay? Equipment for this team seriously crack grenades. I don't. I've said it's very boring. I've said crack grenades about six hundred times. Um, crack grenades are really good. Like that's not new. But what? Like they're much better for these guys than any other team I've ever seen because of the opportunity cost of a crack grenade. Consider what a crack grenade is. Right? They're consistent in every book, so they're always three up to hit. So if they are a team like these guys or the Krieg who are normally hitting on fours, the fact that you're more accurate with the crack grenades because they want to keep them the same. They don't want to say like, oh, bloody crack grenade BS4 plus, space marine crack grenade BS3 plus. I don't know why they don't want to do that, but they don't because they've gone down this road of, okay, sidebar, does kill team actually need the BS to be part of the weapon profile? Would it be that obnoxious if the BS was part of the model's profile and some weapons had pluses and minuses to hit? Is that... I know that seems to run counter to the way GW want to do things, but that doesn't seem like it would be an absurd change. Because right now we got this problem where... Maybe I should title this video and a rant about crack grenades. But we've got this problem where for BS4 up teams, crack grenades are really good. Like, I don't think, actually, on the Phobos, you take it all the time. Not just for the BS thing, but also for the fact that the Phobos can double tap with their bolter discipline. Right? Whereas the Phobos have, have got the opportunity cost of a three up bolter discipline double tap. Yes, it takes both their action points. But on these guys, your opportunity cost is like a four-up last gun shot. Or on many of your specialists, your opportunity cost is a big fat nothing. Because they don't have a ranged weapon. So take three crack grenades, take the ground here, have four crack grenades. I think that is the path to victory. Um, people are going to disagree and say that you take take frags sometimes. And against big hordes, yeah, sure, you can take frags. You can mix it up a bit. You, Of course you can mix it up a bit. And it's very reductive to say, oh yes, crack grenades. But especially especially for this team, more than any other team in the game, I think crack grenades are just really good. Um, what else have they got? Armor plates, 2 EP. Each time a shooting attack is made against his opportunity, they're all defense dice step. You can reroll any of all of your defense dice results of one. Yeah, it makes you a bit more tanky. Is it worth 3 EP? I'll leave that to you. Chem breather. So 1 EP. So 1 EP is useful because if we do take three crack grenades, we've got 1 EP left. So we've got a couple of 1 EP items to really consider. The chem breather um, lets you ignore all modifiers to your APL. You're not affected by stun. Fair. Yeah. How often are you getting stunned? How often are you losing APLs? Don't know. Don't know. Sinister trophy. Um, 3 EP, 
while an enemy operative is in engagement range with this operative, subtract one from the attack's characteristic of melee weapons it's equipped with. A big fat meh from me, um, because you have seven wounds, so taking them down from four attacks to three attacks is probably not going to help you that much. Certainly not for three EP, and you can only take one, and yeah. Incendiary shells for your trench sweeper's shotgun. Um, it gives it the blast one inch special rule and it subtracts one from the weapon's normal damage characteristic. Wow, it makes it worse uh, for two EP. No, thank you. Beast pelt, so another one EP thing. Um, each time a shooting attack is made against its operative, if the ranged weapon has a blast or torrent special rule in the roll defense dice set of that shooting attack, you can re-roll one of your defense dice. The operative is unaffected by the splash special rule. Yeah, I would take that on whoever you think is high value that your opponent is desperately going to try and kill. Maybe your leader, maybe your plasma gunner. Um, you're going to have the EP left over, take a beast pelt. You know, re-rolling a defense dice every single time you do defense is good. Wicked Blade, select a bayonet, bayonet shield, or improvised blade. So in other words, take one of your guys that's not a combat specialist, um, apart from, again, the trench sweeper, I suppose. Uh, add one to its normal damage. If you select a bayonet and shield, it costs two EP. So many EPs to buff our trench sweeper. Like, spend four EP trying to make our trench sweeper better. Or just leave our trench sweeper on the side and buy crack grenades. Um... So a third reason to take crack grenades is because basically other equipment is kind of bobbins. Like, I like beast pelts, and I actually think that you could do worse than go, okay, good, um, 10 beast pelts. I mean, that's the Zimbad play, right? He'd look at this list and go, okay, good, 10 beast pelts, yeah. Everybody, uh, everybody except for the Commissar and the, 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 the thug have a beast pelt because they've got the four up armor saves and they're a bit hardier already or everyone except the ogrin and the thug have got beast pelts off we go um but i think actually realistically you want to take crack grenades overcharge okay so ploys um i'll break it down for you tactical ploys good strategic ploys bad uh strategic ploys overcharge last guns one cp so until the end of the turning point, however, each time a LAS weapon is selected for a friendly bloodied operative to shoot with, excluding the sharpshooter's long LAS, you can choose to overcharge it. If you do, it's AP1 and gets hot. Um, and that seems pretty cool, but then you actually look through it and count up how many LAS guns you're going to be taking, and you go, actually, I'm never going to use that. It's the kind of thing that you might use, kind of, if you've got the points, and it's turn four, and you're down to your last couple of guys, and you suddenly go, oh, my last couple of guys were these chaff guys at the back of the board with LAS guns, and I've really got to try and pull something out, so maybe I'll remember that I have overcharged LAS guns, and I'll go for it as kind of my enrage my, my desperation move, like, ha I can overcharge my last guns and you're really screwed now. Probably it won't help. The one game in a million where, like, being able to overcharge your last guns at the top of turning point four with your last two guys lets you kill the enemy and win, it's going to be funny. But it's not something you're going to build a team around. It's not something you're going to be doing every turn. It's not bolter discipline. Uh, glory kill. Select one enemy operative visible to a friendly bloodied operative until the end of the turning point each time a friendly bloodied operative fights in combat with or makes a shooting attack against that. So much verbiage uh, makes a shooting attack against that enemy operative in the roll attack nice step of that combat or shooting attack. You can reroll one of your attack. So you select somebody. Boom. And then you say, when you're attacking them, you can do a re-roll. If it's a combat or a shoot, you get a free roll. It's fine. It telegraphs your plans for the turn, which I don't like. It's one CP to get it. Why would you not just spend the one C? I suppose you can do this, and then you can also um, spend another CP, another re-roll on another dice. But it's given that you can already do one CP for a re-roll as a reactive thing, I don't see the benefit of glory kill really reckless aspirants in the next firefight phase while a friendly bloodied operative that does not have a bloody token is within red of your opponent's drop blown teach it as if it has a bloody token i feel like i'm supposed to think bloodied is far better than it 
I perceive it to be. Um, if it turns out that statistically getting that re-roll from bloodied, uh, sorry, that retained dice from bloodied is, you know, the creme de la creme of special rules, then maybe this is worthwhile, okay? Because if, if you're all up in the other side of the board and you haven't managed to get that many... I mean, I, I feel like by the time you're within red of their side of the board, though, you'll have killed some guys or had some guys killed and you'll have enough bloodied tokens to go around. But if you find yourself over there with unbloodied guys, unbloodied... Does it confuse anyone else that the team is called bloodied and the status effect is called bloodied? Uh, but if you find any unbloodied bloodied that are on the enemy sideboard... Um, then you can give them pseudo bloodied with this reckless aspirant thing. Situational. Um, dirty fighters until the end of the turning point each time a friendly bloodied operative fights into combat in the roll attack by step of that combat. If another friendly operative is supporting them, you can retain one of your successful normal hits as a critical hit, excluding a normal hit retained as a result of a bloodied token. <sighs> the trouble is. How many times do you actually get that supporting combat? How many times? Think back to all your games. How many times do you actually successfully manage to gang up on somebody like that? Because my perception of combat in this game is most of the time you charge somebody, you do a fight, you resolve that fight, and by the end of the fight, somebody's dead. It might not be you. You might have charged into someone that you can't kill. But generally speaking, if you charge somebody, if there is a fight, if there's a fight action resolved, 99 times out of 100, it results in one model or the other being removed. Doesn't it? And so it's quite hard to set up that situation, even with a massive team. It's quite hard to set up that situation where you're uh, in with multiple people. I suppose if somebody tries to charge into you and they stupidly move within engagement range of two people, but how often is it going to come up? Right, so negative about those, but these tactical ploys, I much prefer the tactical ploys. Um, callous disregard, I love this one. Now, this is what I was talking about when there actually might be a reason to take that shield guy. So, callous disregard, use this tactical ploy when a shoot action is declared for a friendly bloodied operative. For that shooting attack, Having other friendly operatives within engagement range of an enemy operative does not prevent the enemy operative from being set as a valid target. When determining line of sight, enemy operatives cannot use friendly operatives' bases as cover. In the roll attack, nice step of the shooting attack, failed hits are instead retained separately as successful normal hits. In the resolved successful hit step of the shooting attack, those retained hits inflict damage on one friendly operative within engagement range of the target operative. Is this in fact the whole point of the team? right is the whole point of the team that you're going to send forward your shield guy and your brute and your um you know your basic troopers whatever else you've got you send them all forward the unwashed masses and they charge people they don't activate the fight phase they just charge people tie them up and then you are then able to move your because you've charged them you've got them fixed in place and then you can kind of move and position around with your shooting fellows and you just shoot into combat you just you, you just tie them up and then you just shoot into combat. I, I, I feel like that's a bit of a Rube Goldberg machine to achieve a result. I don't think that they're, I still don't think it's good, but I think it's funny um, and it could work really well. It might be the key thing for the team. I don't know. They do have, uh, between the brute and the trench, the shield trench guy, they've got two guys who's kind of main, one of their main things is staying alive. So, and the Ogren, of course, is, is but then. Yeah, so then you just shoot into combat with your plasma gun or your sniper rifle. And if you hit your own guy and you kill him, well, then you, you gain your bloody token for getting a casualty that turn. Ah, uh, maybe that's the purpose of, of the team. I don't know. Moments of repute. Moments of repute. Yeah, this will be vital from time to time. So you can just spend a CP to give one of your operatives three APL. As long as they're a gaze of the gods operative. So good uses for that. If you've got a combat guy with a crack grenade and you want to throw your crack grenade and fight and charge, three APLs are good use for that. Otherwise, playing around scenario plays when three APL really comes in or just wanting a free dash. Reward earn one CP. Use this tactical ploy when an enemy operative is incapacitated by a friendly bloodied uh, and you gain an extra bloodied token. I think the CP is better than the extra bloodied token, but you have the option to convert the two. 
It might come up one game every so often. Dark Favor. Use this tactical ploy when a friendly bloodied operative has a bloodied token is set as a target of a shooting attack. Select one other friendly bloodied operative that does not have a bloodied token and is within a circle and visible to the active operative and you force the, 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 the shooting attack to be resolved against the other operative. Um, which is quite nice, especially if you've got some lower value things like basic troopers hanging around as well. Tack Ops. Three tack ops, two good, one terrible, I think, in my opinion. Uh, worthy champion. If a friendly bloodied operative that's under gaze of the gods incapacitates one or more operatives during the turning point and is within red at the centre of the kill zone or your opponent's drop zone at the end of the turning point, you score a VP, do it again, get a second VP. Do your mechanic, play aggressively, gain VP, don't worry about it. Bear in mind, you've got to water down the Seek and Destroy deck somehow. That, like, that is legitimately the worst deck, so you're going to put this in. It does, unfortunately, make your bloody tokens seem less like an extra thing that's coming on top of you and making you stronger, and a little bit like a thing that you've got to make sure is in the right place, a bit of a tax to let you score objectives, which I don't like the feel of it so much, but... Yeah, that's a perfectly good tack up. Line command is pretty similar. So at the end of a friendly turning point, if friendly bloodied operatives, if friendly bloodied operatives control half or more of the objective markers, and each of these objective markers is controlled by one or more friendly bloodied operatives that have a bloodied token, score one, then score two. If you're going to win, you're going to win more. If you're not winning, then you're not going to score this. Um, and it does require you to have the bloodied tokens. It is a little fiddly. Uh, it's not as good as Worthy Champion above, but remember that that, that core deck, uh, that Seek and Destroy deck, is pretty bad. So you're going to take Malign Command. Bloodbath seems terrible. Um, Bloodbath is really simple. If you've killed more than half of the enemy kill team, you score one. If you've killed three quarters of the enemy kill team, you score two. But you are a weak, high numbers team. You are trying, I, guess, I mean, yes, you want to kill them, but you also want to try and play the objectives. You, you, mm, I just don't think you're going to actually do that many close tablings. But maybe you look at it differently and you think, yeah, oh, I always you know, end up with almost nobody alive on my game. So I'm going to take Bloodbath. But to me, uh, I think it's a bit hard to score. Obviously, it's going to vary depending on what you're up against. Um, killing five... Uh, no, killing six novitiates is, is a much less tall order than making sure that you've killed uh, three Phobos Marines, I guess. I don't know. Final thoughts. I find them to be a fiddly and confused team. Um, they remind me a little bit of novitiates, which I love for fluff and miniature reasons, but I find fiendishly difficult to use. But unlike Novitiates, where the faith mechanic is really, really strong and the entire team kind of works together to one kind of play style, that's getting in close, doing the close combat and the short range firepower thing. Um, these guys seem confused. They've got a sniper and they've got two gunners, but also them. The other half of our team's kind of quite weak combat specialists, so you have to kind of split it into two groups and have your front line and your back line. But then there's a fair chance that you're going to be aggressive with your front line and then it's going to get massacred. Um, I think it will take a lot of skill to play them well, but then I think even when somebody really learns them and is playing them super well, they're still not going to get that rewarded by them. They're not going to because. There's a certain paradigm where you want, like, some teams to be pretty straightforward and easy for people to get into, like, pretty solid teams, and some teams to be, uh, you know, more difficult teams where a novice player playing a difficult team will lose to a novice player playing a, a solid team generally, and then if, they, if, you, if you skill up the players the expert player playing the difficult team will tend to beat the expert player playing the, the solid team. Like, the game generally has those vague, vague ideas, those vague kind of archetypes. I feel like these have a high skill ceiling, uh, like a sort of more, more complex team, but I don't feel that they will actually get to that point where they're even piloted by a really skilled player. They're going to get to that point where they're just that much more powerful than things that are easier to pilot. 
tell me that I'm wrong in the comments. I, I'm being negative. I'm, I'm kind of being down on them before I've, I've even ever played them. I probably never am going to play them because chaos in this house tends to go. Chaos and Eldar tend to go to Mrs. Tabletop Impulse and I tend to scoop up everything else. So they're going over to her. I'm probably never going to play them. I probably will end up playing against them at some point. But I just don't think, I just don't see quite what's there. Um, yeah. If I'm wrong, tell me in the comments, leave a comment, like the video. For the third time of asking, please do subscribe, it really helps me out. I want to get to 500 subs, that would be really cool. Um, Morok, I'm being such a shill today, I'm sorry. Morok is still in stock at Element Games, so if you are meaning to pick it up and you haven't yet, then it's 100 quid, 20% off on Element Games. They've still got loads of them in stock. I did just get a shipping notification from Element Games. They seem to think in their email that it's going to be arriving tomorrow, which would be Thursday, which would be quite a little way before the street date. But it's the it's uh, Queen Elizabeth's nearly said jamboree platinum jubilee. So we've got like a, an extra two day bank holiday. So I think that they've sent it out today knowing that it'll get delivered on saturday because the postal service aren't working but the reason i tell this anecdote is just because they're on it there's a if you pre-order from games workshop if you pre-order from games workshop i guarantee it won't leave their warehouse I'm, i'll probably be end up being wrong now but my past experience with uw tells me if you pre-order from games workshop it won't leave their warehouse till saturday it'll get stuck behind all the other bank holiday post in, in the backlog there and it, it'll show up in your house in the middle of next week um, and you'll wish you'd pre-ordered from a third party so you know um, I'm going to be live streaming Thursday night maybe if I'm wrong about when the postman's working I'll have Morok days early and I'll be building that most likely I will be finishing my Phobos captain who I started on the last hobby stream um, because for some reason I'm starting a Phobos army Really, that's just about hanging out, hobby and chatting. And as I'm on holiday, I'll be having a few beers as well. Join us for that, if that's something that suits you. But otherwise, I just remains to say, uh, have a fantastic rest of your evening. And cheerio, everybody.